Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening at Space Cowboy Books Online. I am your host, Jean-Paul Garnier, and tonight we are lucky to have Ken Lane with us, local favorite, amazing writer. Ken Lane publishes Desert Oracle and hosts its companion radio show and podcast from a haunted old compound in the great Mojave wilderness, one of the four American deserts he's called home. He loves all desert creatures, gopher snakes, ravens, coyotes, and antelope ground squirrels. So thank you all for joining us. Desert Oracle Volume 1 is out. If you don't have it yet, I'm going to share a link in the chat where you can get that. I know we all love to collect these. Oh. And we finally have the book. And we're going to talk a little bit, too, about one of my favorite novels that I read this last year, which is Ken's Dignity, which is a fantastic novel. If you haven't read that, I highly recommend getting it. I will also share links for that in the chat. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Ken to read to us for a little while, and then we're going to get into the interview segment of the event. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, and we will get to as many of them as we can. So, on to Mr. Lane. Hello, Jean-Paul. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, why can't I hear me? You're How coming... Coming through good on this end. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you for doing this. Joshua Tree's only science fiction bookstore. That's also a general interest bookstore and a desert titles bookstore, isn't it? Yes, all of the above. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for tuning in to... Uh, Night 23 of Jean-Paul and I doing hostage videos. I hope you are, are donating to our fund. Uh, I need a book. I do not have a book. What do I have? I have official mail from the Rosicrucian Order. Here's my book. Um, let's read something I have not read for for the book promotional tour. This is a book tour, by the way. I, uh, I was thinking about bringing a suitcase in here so it felt like I was going, you know, places because uh, it's not the same. But hopefully you'll all get your vaccination soon so we can, we can proceed in person. This is a little story about somebody that, that uh, JP and I both admire. Uh, and, a, and an important voice in in the American desert and on the airwaves, and that's the the late great Art Bell, uh, the founding host of Coast to Coast AM, which at its peak was heard on, I believe, more than a thousand stations around the world, including like Armed Forces Radio Network, and uh, you could hear it pretty much wherever you could tune in on AM. But he broadcasts from Pahrump, Nevada. And this is called When the Nights Were Weird, Art Bell and the Kingdom of Nye. And it's 1990s prime. The late night radio show Coast to Coast AM was an unscripted audio mix of Twin Peaks and the X-Files. It was uncomfortable and laughable, utterly paranoid, completely of its own time, and occasionally terrifying. Because it was broadcast in the middle of the night, if you listened, it was generally because you were alone, driving a deserted highway, or fighting insomnia, or working a graveyard shift under fluorescent lights. A parade of oddballs told their tales each night, people seemingly lacking even a basic sense of humor, all of them explaining conspiracies both obvious and fantastic. 
And then, because this was the golden age of weirdness on the early World Wide Web, you could look up these radio characters and discover that Major Ed Dames, for example, really was a retired military officer who really did remote viewing on CIA contract up at uh, Stanford Research Institute, which broke off from Stanford University because of its involvement in Vietnam War profiteering. The Stanford board decided, why don't you go off on your own? So they did, and then they started doing psychic spy stuff, which isn't in this story. Except, incidentally, if you ever listen to Major Ed Dames, Major Ed Dames thought there was a whole civilization on Mars that only he had found from, like, looking at GIFs of NASA pictures. It was fantastic. Uh, he worked also for a secret government project called Stargate which was also apparently a real thing. This was always a terrifying part about the show. Some of it, maybe all of it was true. Behind it all was exactly the kind of person you were told to avoid in real life. Art Bell, a chain smoking hermit and DJ with a sinister laugh who worked from a mobile home compound in the high desert, just west of Nevada's Area 51, the most notorious secret government base of all. In October 1998, at the peak of his fame, Bell announced the first of a bewildering series of retirements from Coast to Coast AM. Five years later, the weeknight broadcast was handed over to a Midwestern radio personality named George Norrie, who still hosts the late night show from Premier Networks, but studios in Los Angeles. The program lost the lonely desert feel that had made it so unique. Although the veteran paranormal reporter George Knapp can occasionally be heard guest hosting on Sunday nights from Las Vegas. Art Bell's many retirements, perhaps a dozen in all, had just about been accepted by his aging fans when another surprise appeared, this time on his Facebook page. I am now in negotiation for a new radio show, he posted from Perup in January 2013. No promises, but the wind may be about to change direction. It was always vague and mysterious with Art Bell, who could make the most innocuous subjects, such as where his cats were hiding in his home studio on any given night, carry the emotional dread of annihilation by extraterrestrial invaders. The jarring transition from voyeuristic amusement to lock-the-doors paranoia was the peak experience for the Art Bell listener. And that was the reason to keep listening. Well, I can't read this whole thing, but I'll read another paragraph. Art Bell is tragic proof that fame and fortune cannot guarantee a pleasurable life. He first quit the radio show at the height of its popularity in the late 1990s, reportedly because some local psychopath had sexually assaulted Bell's young son with the stated goal of infecting the boy with HIV. In 2006, Bell's third wife, Ramona, died in the couple's RV, where it was parked outside a casino motel in Laughlin, Nevada, the kind of place where you could still find nickel slots and half the clientele drag portable oxygen canisters behind them. He apparently sat around his Mojave Desert compound for a while after the death of Ramona Bell and then decided to move to the Philippines and marry a girl he met over the internet. He finally came back to Pahrump but immigration problems kept his fourth wife out of the United States for many years. And then, if you read the rest of the story, you'll see how uh, he had a very dramatic comeback planned on Sirius XM satellite radio. And he did it for like a week or two. And then he's like, ladies and gentlemen, there are shadow people on the property. I must terminate the broadcast. And that was it. He quit. Thank you for sharing that with us, Ken. I know a lot of us that were Coast to Coast fans back in the 90s have found a new home with Desert Oracle uh, for weird late night radio. I know for Thank me, it was, you. for me, it was a uh, Coast to Coast was always one of those things you accidentally found in the middle of the night uh, yeah. and, and were excited to do so. And of course, talk about, uh, you know, uh, titter and time travelers showing up. So they, they had me hooked with all that. Oh, me too. John Titter. I wonder where he is now, but... Um, He's in about 2068. 
And, uh, and when he comes back, he's going to tell us what happens at the end of the pandemic. Now, uh, uh, I, I hinted at this on, on Twitter the other day, um, talking about doing this with you and with Space Cowboy. Um, you did an episode of the radio show, one of our few hour-long live from the studio in downtown Joshua Tree uh, episodes about time travel and and specifically about this weird institute that you'd found the anderson institute is that the name of it anderson institute is correct i have to say i've done a little bit of research since we spoke about that and the only other thing i've come up with is some pictures of half-finished buildings on the east coast that are apparently uh, the Anderson Institute being built whenever those Google Earth images are from. Um, I will fill you in if I find any more information. They seem to come and go, uh, which suggests to me some sort of Mandela effect. You mess with time and God knows what will happen next. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's been haunting me ever since we, we talked about it. Well, I will keep you filled in if any new developments come up. Um, time travel's a little dodgy in that way, though. Uh, you change something and it changes everything. So who knows? But these things seem to live in our minds regardless if they disappear from the, the world at large. But tonight we're here to talk about Desert Oracle. So I wanted to get into the, I know there's an audience question here that matches one of mine. I wanted to ask you, uh, I know throughout the radio program and the field guides in the book, you've encountered so many strange things and reported on so many strange things. What have you discovered or researched that has left you the most uneasy? What, what's some of the strangest, more nefarious and difficult things you've encountered? Um... The story I did that made that made me queasiest was uh, about an offshoot of Alistair Crowley's OTO um, that began at USC or across the street from USC with a, a New Age bookstore called Age of Horus, uh, and they called themselves the Solar Lodge. And they wound up being uh, broken up out of a small desert town about two and a half hours east of, of us here in Joshua Tree called uh, Vidal, which was the only permanent home it turned out of Wyatt Earp. But they moved to this town. They had the gas station and the motel and the diner and whatever uh, on, on uh, 93 coming up the river. And when the sheriffs broke it up, they found children in wooden boxes out in the sun. They were alive. It became known as the boy in the box scandal. And it happened concurrently with the, uh, uh, the, the climax of the, the Manson story. And Manson had actually passed through this place. And so the implications that there were other operations that Charles Manson had some kind of involvement in that were all up to no good. You know, I'm all for ceremonial magic, but uh, they were uh, locking kids. And in fact, the reason this kid was locked in a cage is because he actually burnt, he accidentally burnt up a bunch of Aleister Crowley's letters, his correspondence, the sacred text, you know? So they're like, you get, you know, it's like uh, uh, Steve McQueen in The Great Escape or something, you know, 60 days in the cooler. They put him in this wood box. And so there was a big trial, but it got eclipsed in media coverage by the Manson stuff. So that one made me the queasiest. The one that uh, has made me feel unease. is the the many many reports of of these strange entities uh inside on 
and under Edwards Air Force Base. There, there are decades of these just weird reports, including the, the thing I dug up that I put in a, a piece in the book called uh, The Known Unknown, Tales of Yucca Man, is uh, from the Edwards on-base newspaper. So it's not a conspiracy theory. It's not a Reddit thread. It's not my brother used to know this guy, you know. It was real. It was a reunion of the security guards, the base security guards. They were called the Desert Rats, Air Force Security. You know, they're, enli- they're like enlisted on-base cops. And their job was just driving around the perimeter of Edwards Dry Lake. Murak Dry Lake is his real name. Uh, all the time looking for spies, right? I mean, Chuck Yeager's testing stuff. You got all kinds of fantastic secret projects going on. And... And, and it's also the other end of, uh, of a long base that ends with Area 51, Groom Lake. A lot of people think Groom Lake, you know, they built it for the, the aliens. No, they built it as the end of the test plane route over the Mojave Desert. It's called the uh, um, supersonic corridor. So the idea that these entities, including... The, 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 the families of Sasquatch that walk through walls. This is like interdimensional, bizarre science fiction stuff. And these guys who were cops on base are all talking about it at their reunion in 2009. So the, all these old guys are about to die. They send like the intern over, you know, I'll go, you know, take down the, the security guards are having a reunion. And it's all about, oh yeah, there was... Marvin of the Mojave, which was a nickname for one of the, the uh, entities with the massive blue eyes. Old Blue Eyes was another nickname for him. And uh, this is like one of the most uh, high security places in the world. And it seemed to be common knowledge that ghost monsters of some kind are just constantly walking around, hanging around it. It, it, it gives you the sense that uh, uh, we don't really have as strong a defense as we think in this country. And I know I've heard things like, uh, <clears throat> you know, with the UFO phenomenon, we'll talk more about this later, but that um, often military bases are a hotbed for this stuff. But that does beg the question, uh, is it the military's behavior or are these things attracted to the military? Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, I think they're attracted. I mean, this is the, the, the UFO uh, nuclear facility con- connection that uh, came up in the Condon report, which was the last congressionally funded study that was done by the University of Colorado in 1968. And they found incident after incident, especially on those missile silos in the Midwest of things toying with security all night long. They'd be like, oh, there's something over uh, uh, the silo A42. And they'd all run over there and have an alert and it would dis- and it would disappear and then it would be at the opposite side. And, it was- and then the electronics in the silos would go off even though none of them are connected. You know, it'd be like one would go off and then that one would, it was, uh, there's, I mean, it's, uh, uh, especially since 1947, it seems that, the the focus of of whatever the ufo phenomena is really seem to move over to uh, uh military and cops and things like that it's like now we're gonna bother these guys so when you're going about doing research for the content in desert oracle both the radio show and the uh the magazine and now books um what do you consider, um, or how do you go about doing your research uh, for for both the content there and for your travels through the desert? You know, on on a less occult and strange level, just uh, for traveling through the Southwest and the the naturalist side of you. How do you go about uh, researching and finding these places? Sometimes it's it's a story I knew a long time ago, and I finally have the opportunity to 
spend some time looking into something that maybe was interesting uh, 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 a long time ago. And um, other times it'll be something you hear. You're at a, you're at a barbecue and there's a bunch of like desert people around and they're telling tales around the you know, barbecue in the, in the beer chest. And you lived here a long time. You know, this happens. You Sometimes you'll be talking about something totally different, like, uh, you know, can I borrow some money or something? And then suddenly people will start saying, oh, did you see that thing over the national park two weeks ago? Or, you know, did you see something over here? Or people arguing whether it's flares or whatever. Uh, so a lot of times you get stories, folkloric stories, just because people know that you'll listen to them. Um, you know, you're like, yeah, that guy will want to hear your story about an alien who appeared in your, you know, kitchen or something. So, um, and then I found on a more, uh, I don't know, uh, uh there's, Often at some random place will appeal to me for some reason. I'll see a picture of it by accident. You know, like you're doing a Google image search for something and something you don't know shows up. You're like, oh, what the hell is that? Maybe it's a natural feature. Maybe it's a, a little town or something. And you look at the place name. You think, oh, I've never been there. You know, it's like population 24, uh, the corner of New Mexico or something. And then because I'm always looking for stuff to do for the radio, or for the, the magazine, I think, well, let's just take a look because I bet there's a bunch of weird ass stuff that happened there. And then you look and it's like, you know, of course, and then it's connected to this. And so they usually kind of fall into a you know, place like that um, as far as the sort of bigger stories about something. and. Um, for traveling, I'm, I hate interstates. Um, I don't like to fly. And it's terrible for the environment anyway. You know, the easiest travel you can do on the environment is like in a gas guzzling truck. Um, but I don't have a gas guzzling truck. I have a, you know, it's got a good responsible MPG rate. And just kind of wander around places and uh, uh, take the, the, the back way, take the wrong way. You know, Edward Abbey, who we all love out here in the, the desert bookstore world, um, his, his uh, slogan was take the other. With the idea being you have a choice between a nice, smooth, new, highway that goes straight to the corporate gas station with the subway and the Dairy Queen inside or there's a screwed up old dirt road gully kind of something to the side with a big sign saying do not enter with skull and crossbones we'll go that way and you'll find some you know interesting things to to learn about out here if I remember correctly, he was against the building of roads in our national parks, which I have to say I'm I'm with him and I wish there was a little more credence paid to that. He but, he was uh he liked he thought dirt roads that were there were fine. He just didn't think road building programs should be something that, you know, could continued and uh Yosemite in summer has now actually instituted the thing that he demanded in, in his book. Um, I believe it was Abbey's Road, the book that had that phrase I was talking about in, um, that at peak season, now you got to take the bus in. So we're getting there. There's some progress. So when dealing with particularly strange cases, I know, you know, we'll get a lot of rumors, hearsay, great stories from people that live in these areas. But when dealing with particularly strange cases, what do you consider to be credible sources for doing your research? Hmm. Well, 
I'm not like the 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 UFO prover show or something where I'm uh, promising that I'm going to like solve, you know, some riddle. Like who, uh, you know, who left that tire in Amboy? We will find out. Uh, or, you know, a famous UFO case to solve or something. So I like uh, basically two things will please me with a story like that. That it actually appeared, it was published. There's a contemporary account of it. Like if something happened in 1968 in Needles, California, I should be able to look on like newspapers.com or something and find some reference to it or or call the local historical society or something. If there's no record of the thing happening when it happened, barring time travel, of course, which may, you know, throw, they might have gone back in time and, and changed the story. But Otherwise, there'll be there'll be something. Uh, so mostly, I look for stuff that like left some trace at its time, and that tends to weed out some of the old internet message board stuff that sometimes shows up. Like there's a thing that goes around if you look on Google right now, uh, Charles Manson, Amboy, California. A couple of things will come up. I heard Charles Manson uh, is from Amboy, California and committed some of his murders there. That is the actual post. And I'm like, really committed some of his murders. Somehow he was never, you know, charged or convicted really for committing any actual murder. And he's a hillbilly from, from Appalachia. Appalachia on that side. Uh, his mother tried to sell him for a pitcher of beer. You know that? It's a very sad story. That's uh, quite quite grim. And there's not many people to kill in Amboy either, incidentally. Not a lot. Not a lot. The few, I mean, people do die in Amboy at the crater, but they do so uh, from exposure. I mean, we, we have usually about two people a year. And, but Charles Manson didn't do those. So in the in the radio show and in our conversations, uh, you often reference the work of Philip K. Dick. Obviously, Space Cowboy is a science fiction bookstore, so this it hits close to home. What about his work resonates with you, and what do you think is the philosophical relevance of doubting the framework of reality, which is such a um, deep theme in all of his work? And then, outside of Philip K. Dick, are there any other science fiction authors whose work you find intriguing? I intend I, I uh, went into an intensive Philip K. Dick reading phase at a I think probably not the normal time if there is a normal time for such a thing uh, I was like around 40 and or late thirties or something, but I was like an adult. Um, I had, uh, I was working for you know, blogs, writing for blogs. And it was the, uh, uh, it, it was the Bush years, the Bush junior years. And it was still, and it was still like the, not that we ever got out out of it, but it was like the Patriot Act, uh, surveillance, the the secret rooms in the Pacific Bell Building in San Francisco. I mean, people forget what an outrage all this stuff had been, and and there were all the conspiracy theories about the FEMA death camps, and uh, people kept finding what they thought were like these massive warehouses full of body bags and. It was just a deeply weird time, and the internet was uh, kind of smarter in a way then. It wasn't quite as 
full full user as as we are in you know our time we're pretty much uh through social media especially you know, the majority of people are on it and everything felt so kind of half fake anyway that and I didn't know anybody where I lived. I lived up in Reno, Nevada at the time. I just moved up there. And so I just read, I don't know, 20 or 25 PKD novels in a row. And then would make a pile and throw the ones that I thought I ought to read again soon. And then I'd go back to those because you can read them really quick. A lot of them are pretty short, but often you need to read them three, four or five, a dozen times or something the really inspired ones where there's some kind of deeper message that I don't think he ever fully articulated or saw completely clearly. Um, and there was a, the, a, as we got into the last four or five years worldwide, but in this country as well, um, it has books more and more didn't seem like sort of mildly prophetic but a lot of them seem like actual visions uh that you could match up with specific people and places and things and and but in that usually uh that uh, that what usually happens with sort of clairvoyance uh and getting glimpses of the future stuff is kind of scrambled it's not fully settled so you know, there's uh, uh, there there are books that I've returned to in the last couple of years that seem like just a slightly jumbled and not at all exaggerated version of of reality. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, and then uh, who else? I don't read a ton of sci-fi. I did when I was younger, um, and. It's not because I quit reading sci-fi. It's because I I quit reading fiction. Um, I read so much bad fiction early in this century, the aughts, that people were saying was great. And I thought, you know, I, I think I'm not the market anymore, um, if I ever was. I was never the market for popular fiction. I always liked kind of oddball stuff and people would say oh you'd love this it's right up your alley and i i did not and i thought i'm just not going to read fiction for a while so um i make an exception every now and then if i just happen upon something and i like it but well that's fair enough um and Philip K. Dick did come out publicly and say that some of the things in his books were true. He wouldn't say what, but uh, he, he did make that announcement publicly uh, to very bizarre response. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the last time I actually got to see you and hang out with you, which was way too long ago due to present circumstances, you were telling me about the Desert Oracle Institute. I'd love it if you'd tell us a little bit more about the idea behind this and, and what those plans are. Um, I don't know. Uh, the Desert Oracle Institute is is this still sort of hazy idea that there will be some sort of Desert Oracle Institute that would, perhaps without the need for my constant, you know, daily involvement could serve as uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, some sort of strange combination of like a monastery run by lunatics. And what they do is they uh, collect historic and folkloric and environmental uh, records of the time. So uh, I have no idea what it is, but I, I know where I'll put it which which is uh, 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 a place here in the high desert um, after I don't need it for what I'm using it for now. Well, if you want to make that part library, you, you know who to contact for help. I sure do. I sure do. Yeah, it would, I mean, it would, the, the most real thing about it would be books and documents. 
I love that idea. I think especially with our local history, it deserves to be done. Um, so obviously you and I are out here in the Mojave, neighboring the Sonoran Desert. Uh, I'm not sure where our audience is. I know some of you are out here as well. But uh, these are only a few of the deserts around the world. You've lived in a few of the other deserts, um, including deserts like Antarctica, which we don't normally think of as a desert. So what I wanted to ask was, what are some of the weirdest things you've heard uh, about these other deserts around the world? Oh, um, well, one, one place that I'm very interested in exploring um hopefully with with some local uh experts in the in the kinds of subjects i like uh, to accompany me is uh, a desert that's very very similar to our own great basin which is just north of of the mojave here which is a high uh dry cold desert that gets uh, some good snow in the winter and is hot, but not nearly as hot as, as the summertime Mojave uh, in Northern Mongolia, kind of going up against Siberia. Uh, it, I mean, it looks like, it looks like the Eastern Sierra and the DNA of the population of Northern Mongolia going into Siberia is the origin DNA for uh, most indigenous Americans. So it's kind of like the, you know, the, the, the Garden of Eden, the original home of, of the Americans pre-European colonization. And the difference primarily um, other than horses didn't go extinct there as they did in, in the new world until the Spanish started losing them 500 years ago, um, is that there is a lot of megalithic uh, monumental stuff up there. Lots of kind of Stonehenge style menhirs and uh, circles of stones and uh, me megalithic stone building. Uh, and that to me, that that is the kind of uh, wild thing about the North American deserts is how it's really one of the only places in the world that doesn't have megalithic structures because they're in Africa, Asia, Europe, pretty much, and, and parts of South America, like Easter Island. But we lack it right here. Um, so I think it would be a uh, uh, a wild trip to stay up there for a couple of months and you know do a couple of issues about uh the northern asian high desert it's interesting we don't have many monoliths here because we've had plenty of cultures that were excellent masons i don't know if you've ever made it out to chaco canyon oh yeah instance, yeah incredible masonry work um that's still standing in large part you know uh, half a millennia later and the and the uh the the canals of phoenix are the canals that the, the salt river project uses today they're a thousand years old amazing so changing the topic slightly uh, i wanted to ask you what would you do if you personally encountered the yucca man well the yucca man fits into a classification of uh of monster that uh, the late great researcher John A. Keel described as a big hairy monster, BHM. And these are a, a constant thing ar around the world, usually in the kind of like wildland suburban interface of any you know city or large village or something. Uh, they tend to be they tend to be occurrences that happen on the outskirts of town. There's a reason why. We know in our hearts when somebody says, oh yeah, something's going on in the outskirts of town. You know it's going to be something shady. And one thing that happens, like in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, uh, in the late 1960s, 67 and 68, 
was uh, uh, the appearance of a, of a big hairy monster that they eventually called the Mothman, um, which uh, had like wings. It was like a, it is a thing that kids do with memes now, biblically accurate angels. It's really horrific. Look it up. You know, biblically accurate a- angels. And it's like, it'll be like a floating ball that's all like eyes and teeth. And it says, do not be afraid. So Mothman, in fact, some early witnesses of Mothman described it as like an angel. Seven feet tall, all black, red glowing eyes, and these these like bat wings. Um, so these things tend to be associated with fear. Um, there's usually a terrible stench that comes with these things. That's the famous... Uh, uh, smell of uh, uh, brimstone, uh, sulfur, you know, that always comes with the, the monster sightings. Um, so you don't, you're not going to befriend these things. They attack people. They apparently have enough physical form, like in that famous case in Riverside in 1973, where this thing jumped out in the middle of Main Street. This guy's driving down Riverside in, in, in a, 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 a town it's not that late and this thing comes out from the trees and drags its massive black claws over his windshield the claw marks are there across the windshield when the cops get there and they're like what happened he's like he disappeared the next night the same thing came out and riverside's what an hour from here hour and 10 minutes something like that did the same thing so we've had them all around here. So I guess what I would do is uh, stand my ground like you do with a mountain lion. You know, try to look bigger, put your shoulders out. Uh, and then I guess if it got too close, I hear that they f- fade away in a second. If you do the old, in the name of the Lord, I command you. That's what the Irish always do with the scary ones. So I guess I'd do that. So I've heard with entities like the Yucca Man, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, etc. cetera, um, I have some friends that believe they're trans-dimensional beings, yeah. uh, which I'm curious what you think about that. But also, do you think these creatures are related to the creatures in, say, uh, the Book of Revelation? Oh, yeah. And, and then we also have a question from Anne in the audience here. Have you ever smelled the sulfur? Um, no, I have not. I have not, uh, uh, seen anything like, like this. Um, I don't think, I, I certainly don't doubt that people have seen them. You know, the behavior of the things is a famous case over in the Western Mojave, uh, in early 1970s, 1972, 1973, bunch of new suburbs went up for Edwards and Lockheed and everything raw desert right on the edge of the wild desert that seems to upset you know something uh the desert sasquatch which is what they called it there because it was the age of Bigfoot and um the sasquatch in Vancouver the desert sasquatch would come onto the patio like the back patio And like little rinky-dink tract houses like we have out here in the desert suburbs. It's like you have a sliding glass door and you have the kitchen next to it. And they come out there, they'd be standing there in the porch light, scratching at the door. It's like, that's meant to be seen. You know, that's not like a shadow you thought you saw behind the garage late at night when you were taking out the trash or something. And so there were posses that were formed. And this is, these are all ex-military. They've all got guns and they're out in the desert. Everybody's got guns. So they'd go out into the wash behind the suburb and they almost had a shootout with each other because one group was over here and one group was over here and there's a bunch of desert willows and stuff between in the wash. The one group thought they heard desert Sasquatch and you know, seconds away from just this massacre. And it was... What, but whatever it was just kept disappearing. So uh, I, um, that, you know, w- the great thing about saying like trans-dimensional or it involves quantum physics or something 
is you can just stop talking about it then because it's like yeah everything's technically a possibility you know um john keel's theory is the one that i think makes most most sense because it is it it seems to occur totally on on the uh, em spectrum um the the apparitions tend to start on one end of visible light and end on the other so red to purple um red is often the color that ufos and the monster's eyes flash before they disappear so if it's some manipulation just at the edge of the light spectrum that can pop in or out what makes it weird is like in ireland some people they say can see all this stuff so they've got second sight they're seers we don't have cultural terms for that in the united states so when people see things you know we just tend to think oh you're hallucinating or whatever but there may be as keel also thought some variation in light perception so that some people who are percipients perhaps just can see a little more outside uh the visible light spectrum than others i don't know but it's whatever it is it's consistent through history there's always monsters there's never a place without monsters. And finally, you can't say, uh, uh, oh, that's just the Middle Ages. Everybody was dumb, you know, because it happened with our people who got rockets on the moon. So it's happened in our time and it ha and it's happened within our cultural frame of reference. It's an interesting thing about cases like this is uh, it, they don't stick to one milieu. It's it's cross across the board all kinds of people um speaking of, of strange things uh, living out here we both see and hear many strange things from our neighboring military base i wanted to ask you do you think there's a connection between the base and the ufo sightings and other bizarre phenomena that a lot of people experience out here in joshua tree and yeah. do you think that it's possible, is there an underground facility here at the 29 Palms base? Oh, I have had, I, I'm not giving it anything away here because I have not found any, you know, backup for it. But I've had a number of people, you've probably heard these stories too, come up to me like after public events and stuff and say, I worked on base 12 years, there's underground stuff there. So yeah, I've heard that. Um, I don't think that the Marine Desert Training Center up in 29 Palms has has transdimensional, you know, alien airports or whatever underneath. Um, they have uh, they have bunkers, you know, they have exhaust systems, uh, they they have uh, weapon storage, they have sewage, they have landfills. Landfills have caps with uh, uh vents so uh, um i've never seen a bunch of ufo stuff in joshua tree in this area the things i've seen i've seen some like i don't know maybe that's something but i've never seen anything dramatic here most of the things that people have described that they've seen here are the flares that are dumped over the base they're very dramatic and pretty i like to see them and the and the reason they drop them you know there should be like a little brochure that comes with an airbnb or who knows let people think they're they're aliens i don't care but it's they drop these little parachutes that have flares and it's to mimic the situation with the next unlucky desert country that we invade that's the whole reason for the place they have a little miniature uh uh, it was originally built to be an uh, Arabic village where they go fight street to street. And there are people uh, from various countries that we bomb who have immigrated here and work as actors in the miniature uh, Middle Eastern city during the, the height of the Afghanistan Patriot Act uh, 911 era. Uh, they hired Afghans to uh be in villages uh taliban villages so um it lights it up and then they dump a bunch of 18 year olds 
in the sand and say run run and they are illuminated by the by the flares so that's that's the cause of those the weird thing though is that the most common like real ufo sighting that happens right now uh because each era has different kinds you know like i printed a chart once that stopped in the 60s and none of those ufos are seen anymore it's like teacup you know uh are these orbs that move around intelligently and otherwise they just look like orange flares so they're kind of there's always like intentional deception on the ufo side too so maybe sometimes people see flares they think it's something else but as far as like any really big crazy stuff like the phoenix lights hudson valley boomerang in the 80s over uh uh, countryside forest new york i we haven't had anything like that around here from where i live i have a great vantage point of the base and the town out there and uh we we see flares on a regular basis often when people come into the shop they say oh i i saw ufos in the sky and i always ask was it to the northeast and the answer is always yes and so i think hate to burst your bubble it's, yeah. it's, it's flares with little parachutes and that's why they're that's why their flight patterns seem so erratic um I'd like to think it's more however uh out here in the morongo basin we have a pretty rich history of ufo groups uh not just fantastic either um i'm blanking on the name right now but they're in the fifth late 50s there was a little office here in joshua tree uh sort of christian ufo group yep, uh, that yep. produced a lot of small pamphlets uh, to what do you attribute this, and what do you think is different about the approach that these groups have taken in in our area specifically? Well, uh, a couple of things. First of all, the the until recently, nobody wanted to live in the rural Mojave Desert. You know, nobody wanted to do that at all. Um, just to take a, a place like Wonder Valley or 29 Palms or North Joshua Tree, where there's a lot of homestead cabins where people will will stay today in an Airbnb or something, uh, those places were, were for the most part put up during the Homestead Act. There were little cabins that people built that had no water. They had, you had to have your water delivered by tanker, no telephone, no electricity. There were no TV or radio signals up here. So you were really out in the middle of nowhere. So the kind of um, eccentrics who just couldn't take any more of civilization, which were very close to a very big civilization, Southern California, um, this was kind of an easy way to land out here. Uh, George Van Tassel, although he seemed to voluntarily leave a job and have kind of a business plan of what to do here is a good example of somebody who was just kind of weird and the opportunity came to come out to a place where he felt at peace um the guy who did the desert christ park statutes was another guy like that aerospace worker southern california thought ah, i'm you know building uh, bombs and stuff i should be promoting world peace so I built a bunch of giant Jesus statues and got a place to put them out here in Yucca Valley. And he got out here and he loved it and he moved here and he made statues on it you know, to, the, to the end of his life. Um, so the desert attracts people like that. And in the era when those UFO organizations were going on, that was also a very uh, a social era for America that we have totally lost. Um, the, you move to a town, you immediately like join the Rotary Club and you joined a church. You didn't have to be religious. You just joined whatever church was like your, whatever your tradition was, uh, cause people were more traditionally religious in the 1950s and you had a, a group of people and they, they'd come to your barbecues and drank your beer and everything. And it was more social time. So UFO social groups were um just a just another interest that california had plenty of people who would you know gather for that purpose uh, at that time we also had early buddhist groups 
vegetarian groups, uh, the beginning of the new age groups. Uh, ritual magic was never as big here because America is, is more, at least we think of ourselves as more like regular, you know, like, no, nah, we're not going to wear robes and, and, and do a black mass and everything. We'll just have an ice cream social, you know, it's very American. Um, so that, the clear skies, and the fact that UFO, UFO culture comes from uh, Landers, California, from Giant Rock. That's all the early names have involvement there, and that's where the crowds were. With no robes. So I'm, I'm assuming Jack Parsons no. didn't make it out this way. I don't know if he did. He did work in, uh, he did magic rituals with L. Ron Hubbard and the Western Mojave out by uh, Rocket, Rocket Site Road at the end of Edwards, uh, a place where that rocket site actually had some explosion in the uh, 70s and poison gas when there was a big cover up and everything. So, uh, there were bad, bad vibes there. Um, but he may have come out. I mean, he certainly knew some of the, but this was this was more of a a kind of working class midwestern kind of place to come at the time. So I want to move on to a couple audience questions here. This is one from Jamie. Would you object to recommending one of your favorite, perhaps little known, camping spots in the Greater Mojave? Hmm. Uh yeah, I'll, t I'll, I'll tell you one um, that is a place I like to go in late spring and early fall. Um, that's usually too hot for the Mojave, but this is one of the few places where the Mojave River comes up from underground. Uh, it's a place called Afton Canyon, A-F-T-O-N Canyon. Is Bureau of Land Management at the edge of Mojave National Preserve. Um, it's really remote. The railroad runs right by it. So it's, you kind of feel like you're Butch Cassidy, you know, out there. And it attracts a, uh, a kind of old school desert RV um, crowd. It's quiet and people are polite. A lot of people go, you know, once a year or whatever and know everybody and there's actually a river that you can walk through like you can wade in it and everything it's just it's so un Mojave and I have another audience question here this is from Monkey Knot uh what do you think of Carl Sagan um well I I like a lot of people um got my my first dose of uh uh space science from cosmos his his tv show um and i i love carl sagan um i think he was a conflicted person on a on on one level uh an important level the sort of existential and spiritual level because he professed sometimes a kind of disdain for uh, anything that he couldn't prove in a lab. But at the same time, he was kind of a mystic and he was not shy about saying that, that most of his insights had come while high. Uh, he was a, 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 a friend of, of Mr. Natural for really his whole adult life. So I think Carl Sagan was was uh, great. I don't think he's wrong about UFOs either. Um, I don't think there's any evidence that UFOs are, are aliens and spaceships. It's just our cultural perception. The way if you saw the same thing in Portugal a century ago, you'd say it was, uh, you know, the queen of the universe, Mother Mary. If any of the audience is interested in Carl Sagan's views on UFOs, he wrote a whole book about it called Cosmic Connection, which is quite interesting. It's mostly uh, debunking the phenomenon. Uh, as Ken said, you know, Carl was a stickler for uh, empirical evidence. Uh, 
that being said, he believed there was more life in the cosmos. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. really far away. Personally, as we talked about when I was on the show, I tend to think it's more plausible that these are people from the future than it is people from interstellar distances, which are obviously quite vast. Um, before we go, Ken, I wanted to talk a little bit. Um, obviously, we're here about Desert Oracle. It's a wonderful book, and you've got to get it. Thank if, you. Thank you. If you've missed it, back from 2011, Dignity, Ken's novel. This is the best book that I have read in a year, uh, next to The Man Who Folded Himself. I've, I've read a lot of great books this year, probably read 100 over 100 books in the last year. But Dignity stuck out to me. It's an epistolary novel. It is a wonderful story. I cried at the end, which I was absolutely not expecting to do. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about this book and if you have any plans to write more fiction in the future, because I'm, I'm hoping that you do. Um, but aside from that, what are your writing plans in general? Is there a Desert Oracle Volume 2 coming out? And what can we expect from you moving forward? Um, well, first, thank you about Dignity. I wrote that during the previous financial collapse, uh, the one that was that that housing was the uh, straw that broke the, the camel's back. And where I lived at the time was surrounded by new unfinished suburbs and i was kind of haunted by this idea of of all these like nearly completed houses or some were just like studs you know in the sun but like the streets and the driveways and the garages and and all these houses were empty and all these people were losing their houses um and that was just kind of like oh that's that's kind of uh, the way we do things in america uh leave things empty and and meanwhile forcing other people you know out, out of their uh zero down payment balloon payment mortgages and but then the 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 i wasn't kind of i didn't want to write fiction um but i started having these i started seeing this scene frequently and the scene was i didn't understand it it was like a kind of concrete um i thought it was between like two concrete buildings or between like a parking garage and a building it was like a a dirt lot with concrete stuff and and some shrubs and stuff uh and it was packed with people and they were all giving stuff away and then the cops were running in and beating you know beating heads and I thought, what the hell is that? And I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And finally, I thought, it's it must be inspiration, you know? As sometimes it happens so rarely, you don't even know what it is. Like, what's that stupid idea I'm always seeing in my head like it's a documentary film? So I tried to think, like, how to do it, how to do it. And I started kind of writing a letter from one of the characters that was sort of explaining what was going on. I thought, well, that's the way to do it. Then I don't have to mess with all the, uh, I don't have to get bogged down with the characters. They can just speak for themselves and I don't have to describe them, you know? And they seemed to know what they wanted to say. So I wrote it, I published it. And when did it come out? I think it came out like in spring of 2011. And then in September, Occupy Wall Street happened. And it was on the news and it was on Twitter and everything. And that was the place. That was the place I kept seeing that, that concrete park with all those people giving stuff away and the cops rushing in. They were like young people. They looked like, you know, uh, just normal LA modern city, you know, people. So, I went out to Occupy Wall Street and I stayed there for two weeks. And um, I kept meeting people who kept, they were like uh, the guy in, in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, they, they'd seen it. And so when they saw it on the news, they all came. And that's how it got so big so fast. And that was totally unreported. 
that all these people had this, you know, vision of this thing. And that Occupy Wall Street thing, you know, it's still reverberating. It was like a big cultural deal. So there was like this, this odd little flash of it that tons of people got and they went there. So uh, I say that to explain that it takes very special circumstances to, to trick me into writing fiction. So I'm probably not writing any fiction anymore. And how about nonfiction? Can we expect a Desert Oracle Volume 2? Will the magazine continue? The uh, magazine's you- continuing. Um, once there's enough stuff for another volume, because this book, you know, I look at it sometimes, it's like, okay, it's kind of thick. It's a pretty thick book. It's not like a, you know, a slim volume of poetry or something, but it's six years. So I don't know. Will it take six years to get enough stuff together for a second one? I don't know. Um, Hopefully not. We've had a lot of questions from the audience here, and I've actually heard this from people personally, too. Are there any plans of a Desert Oracle audiobook? Because we're all such fans of the show. We all love Red, Blue, Black, Silver's music, a perfect accompaniment uh, for your voice. Are there any plans of an audiobook? Yeah, I want to do one. Um... If anyone from MCD Books, my fine publisher, is watching tonight, like, I don't know, Sean McDonald, the publisher, uh, it's, you know, we're in like book or uh, month three or four since the book came out. So I think we need to do the audio book. Uh, I, I, I plan to do it. I just I just want them to pay for it. Because they're going to sell it, and you know, if you buy it, they'll make money. So as soon as as soon as they want to book a studio and send me over, I'll do it. Well, if the publishers are listening, we have had many requests from the audience, and even an offer to sign a petition for it. Oh. Uh, so for those in the audience that have not picked up this wonderful hardback, this is the best in the five years of Space Cowboy Books. It is our best selling book ever, which is amazing considering hey. it. This came out three months ago and it has outsold any other book we've ever carried in the store. Uh, we've put a link in the chat where you can pick up a copy from us. Also, Ken's Dignity. You've got to read this, uh, especially if you like epistolary novels, which is something I'm a big fan of. We don't see enough of. It's a wonderful book. Apparently, we're not getting any more fiction from Ken, so you've got to read this one. Uh, I've got a question here. Are we open for local book purchases? I am open for appointments only. Please send me an email, spacecowboybooks at gmail. You can also call me. You can find my phone number online. And yes, of course, we have Ken's books. Um, don't have any more, don't have the new issue of the magazine, but we will resolve that issue soon. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Our audience tonight's been wonderful. Thank you, Ken. Uh, if you have any parting statements, now would be the time. Oh, um, well, I'm very glad that, uh, all of you who are here decided to spend some of your, your busy Thursday night with us. Um, you know, like they say, uh, on Southwest, we know when you're going to, you know, watch stuff on a screen, you have a lot of choices. So we appreciate you choosing to, to do, uh, Space Cowboy Books event, which I think is, a, is a bit, this, I think this is the last, the very last Desert Oracle book event. So, uh, for all of you who are here, if you like the book, et cetera. Um, thank you. Thanks for coming. And when are you going to open so we can do stuff in person again? It's hard to say when we'll be able to do in-person events again. Uh, I, I really miss it. I miss seeing all of you guys. I, meet, I miss missing new people. Um, I'm uh, Finances are getting rough, so I'm probably going to be starting to open on Mondays for a while, temporarily. Uh, it's hard to say with live events. Uh, obviously we're going to have to keep it as safe as possible. I don't want to kill anyone over a get together. Um, but ASAP, I miss you guys. I miss doing this in person. Obviously would love to have Ken come up and talk. Um, yeah, I miss everybody. And one of these days we've got to go out to Van Tassel's grave together. Uh, Oh Lord. Yes. 
so, so many things that we need to do and uh, desperately miss the conversations with all, with everybody in person. Um, it's great that we have this. Uh, however, I, I felt I had trepidations asking Ken to do this in the first place because I had just read this. And <laughs> <laughs> it, it, when you read Dignity, you're going to want to throw away your phone. And um, you should. <laughs> thank you, Jean-Paul. But thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Ken. Good night. Thank you.